Welcome back. We'll now move on to our panel discussion. So I'd like to invite all of our speakers today to enjoy the in, to join the final panel that will be moderated by Dr. Manisha Aurora and Dr. Roslyn Wright, who kicked off the symposium yesterday, will also join the conversation. We look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Megan, uh, and thank you everyone for for joining this, this panel discussion. Um, most of the speakers introduced themselves today, but since Dr. Ros Wright spoke yesterday, I'll, I'll quickly introduce her again. Uh, Dr. Rosalind Wright is at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's a professor of pediatrics and also the Dean of Translational Medicine here. Um, given that I've just introduced uh, Dr. Wright, um, let me start off by uh, my first question to you actually. Um, so uh, the question here is, you know, you, you're leading the way in social disparities research. During the pandemic, how has your research and uh, pivoted to examine the social disparities of COVID-19, uh, as well as what are your views on what uh, ways other researchers are trying to do the same? Roz? Yeah, sorry that I came on. I missed the whole question. Except, oh, I'm sorry. What are we okay. doing the same? <laughs> uh, my apologies. I, I I I thought you were on. So let, let, I literally let, just ran into the office. So let, yeah. let, let, let me repeat the question. Um, you know, you're leading the way in, in social disparities research. Uh, during the pandemic, how have you pivoted um, to, to examine the social factors and the disparities? that are related to this pandemic? And, and what, what, what have you seen other researchers do in this area? Yeah, I mean, people, different folks are poised to sort of uh, ask different, you know, sort of come at this different, at different angles. One of the things we did, I mean, we run, we run birth cohort studies and we're part of the larger ECHO program, the national, the U.S. Uh, national Environmental Influence on Child Health Outcomes Program. One of the things that that program did was to uh, stand up pretty readily a, a questionnaire, a survey measure for um, parents and young families and, and about themselves, the parents and their kids, whether they'd been infected or not, or, or, or how they were um, handling uh, things like schooling, that kind of thing. And these are longitudinal studies. So one of the ways we can leverage that data, we have pre-pandemic measurement of some of these things, including biosamples that are there, um, correct? So we're, we're, we're anxious to sort of think about how we can leverage that to do some of the exposomic types of um, uh, work that we've talked about here. But even short of that, we've done some simpler things like collect hair samples pre and post. We can look at uh, hormone levels, cortisol levels, we can see if there have been changes in the stress um, biology in, in some ways. Also stress survey tools. We mentioned how you use many different angles there. One interesting thing that's come out of it, um, not that particular, but I've seen other research focus on, we talked yesterday about health disparities and lots of upstream factors that really put certain populations in the way of many, many toxic effects, you know, uh, environmental factors anyway, pre-COVID. They can only, you know, many of those have been exacerbated by COVID. People have looked for things that are pro-oxidant, for example, um, because there is evidence that COVID, uh, there are worse outcomes if there's increased oxidative stress um, mechanisms that get revved up. So you can imagine if you're living in a very high polluted area, for example, things like PM 2.5, other traffic related pollutants, um, have high levels of psychological stress, that can already sort of push you more towards that pro-oxidant um, uh, you know, phenotype. And if you get the virus on top, you know, your immune system and the inflammatory response and, and oxidative stress may really be ramped up. So you may see more severe disease. We don't know. We have to start to see if, if people have enough um, uh, data to really address those kinds of questions. Certainly, um, there have been a lot of folks focusing on uh, what does it mean for kids um, who, you know, there's limited social contact now, they're, they're homeschooling, parents are, you know, 
having to manage um, their job, you know, maintaining an income as well as help trying to help their kids through this. That's a stress, particularly on single, you can imagine single um, parent households. Uh, many women are greatly impacted because they, many have left their jobs to be able to do that for their children. So we're, there are people that are focused on that. I mean, there's another, uh, we talked about intersectionality a little bit of other uh, identities that sort of put you at higher risk for some of the, the factors. Women in this pandem pandemic across the board, but uh, uh, racial ethnic groups in particular, who were kind of living on the edge, many of them, that's gonna be a, a major factor to, for us to be able to follow and understand. That, that's long-term stuff, I think. Those are some of the, the things that I've seen that people are trying to uh, tease apart. That, th thank you, Roz. Um, there, there, there are many more questions that I'm, and I'll come back to in a while. I'm gonna move on to uh, Donatella, doc, Dr. Placidi. At the start of the, or the first wave of this pandemic um, earlier in 2020, um, you know, Brescia, where, where you work and the surrounding regions had one of the higher rates of COVID-19 um, in, in, in the world and certainly in, in, in Italy. You work in the area of environmental medicine and occupational medicine. Could you weigh in with what, what did you see, especially among communities that are, you know, uh, from the occupational medicine perspective, those who, who are in the workforce? Um, and how would you, as part two of that question, prepare for future public health crisis? What are the lessons that, that you have learned from, from being at the epicenter of the pandemic uh, during the first wave? Yeah. Well, I start to, to told you that uh, when pandemic start, uh, I um, was having um, um, serial conferences on tuberculosis. And uh, um, especially in healthcare settings, but not, not only in healthcare settings, you know that tuberculosis could um, be also when migrants uh, are so such a community or um, um, some other places among the uh, police uh, workforce and so on. And, um, and we uh, start to think about a uh, crowdy place uh, or uh, I don't know, dirty place. And um, when we heard about China that closed Toyota, closed Ikea, for example, because they found that, that their workplace, that workplace, those workplace are uh, dangerous for this uh, SARS-CoV, uh, uh, SARS um, we were uh, thinking, yes, uh, it, it could be really mm, transmissible because um, it's, it's a very strange uh, way of thinking uh, to, to close even this kind of contact that are not so close, like, uh, I don't know, in, in, a, in healthcare setting. And um, uh, so uh, the lesson is uh, to be not, um, to not presume to know everything and to be alert. We, we need to think. Um, and another another uh, impression, another suggestion. Last year, um, I write a sentence in my invitation of my healthcare workers to have uh, influenza vac vaccination. And the sentence was that a uh, hundred years passed from the first pandemic and we are waiting for another pandemic. But when I wrote the sentence, this sentence, I never uh, be uh, so conscious that it was really uh, 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 under the corner, <laughs> around the corner. Um, so um, the occupational physician were in the first line because um, firstly, in the healthcare settings uh, that were the, uh, the, the, um, on, almost the, the only one that stay uh, open during the lockdown. And, uh, but uh, afterwards in one, two months, for example, we have some um, uh, um, 
some um, little epidemic, uh, for example, in the livestock. Uh, and uh, the, the, those was because uh, the um, um, workers there uh, are uh, of low socioeconomic status, live together. Sometimes they, they are um, migrants workers. And um, this, uh, this was another uh, intriguing uh, factor. So the workplace is uh, like a driver for a, a um, situation that could uh, happen outside the work, the workplace, but um, um, the workplace leverage the contact. And uh, so it's not, for example, the, the leaf stocks or uh, I don't know, the, the temperature, but uh, in that case, in those cases, we interpreted uh, those uh, situation with the, the extra, the domestic um, contact. And um, so we are learning a lot from this. And um, you know that we are now rephrasing our pandemic plan for influenza, for example. Uh, so I think this is really um, incredible because we know, well, we supposed to know uh, all we need to know on influenza. Uh, and despite of this, we are rewriting uh, the plan. So maybe we are not knowing <laughs> all <laughs> on this uh, virus in general. And uh, anti mm, the antibiotic resistances. And uh, so biological risk is really a, an intriguing uh, issue that we have to, to consider. And is really uh, interconnected with all the factors that my colleague this afternoon described very well, and uh, pollution and uh, socioeconomical issues. Um, so we, we need to know more. Dr. Dr. Plessy, thank you very much, and and I, and I agree with what you're saying. You know, uh, for 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 many reasons, we often think that we are prepared for this. We've seen this before. We deal with the influenza uh, issue every year, and we deal with outbreaks of measles and mumps in, in our children, and so we we have a handle on this. But if anything, globally, this pandemic has shown us how underprepared we were. Whether you are a country with highly socialized medicine like Sweden and, and the UK taking two very different approaches, but doing not, not that much, just as bad as the US. Uh, there have been success stories like you know, New Zealand, of course. Um, part of that is the, the, their geography. You know, when you're living on an island and you, you, you can cut off, but I agree with you. Uh, what we have learned here after the pandemic is over will inform us for, for, for many, many years to come. So, so thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. I'll, 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 I'll put it to Dr. Roel uh, Romulin from, from, from the Netherlands. I've heard from your work and uh, from, from all these different and very nice talks that there are many, many different uh, data sets out there. However, what caught us off guard at, at early on in the pandemic was uh, that the data was coming in so slowly. So how do we accelerate that data, uh, A? And then part B of that is because it's such disparate and diverse data, which is a good thing, but exposomics is still in its early stages. How do we bring all of that data together to, to form a coherent story that can inform policy? Thanks uh, for, for this question. Um, I, I certainly concur with, um, the observation that we were we're struggling to get all the data to together, and and, and frankly, um, still in the Netherlands, I'm I'm not able to actually link um, testing data to 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 health records. So there's still um, limitations that that we we have to actually get to, to these answers. Um, there, there are technical solutions to um, actually link uh, data with guaranteeing privacy and. and what, what it has done in the Netherlands is actually that it has led to an investment into um, 
accelerating basically um, the linkages between different data sets and um, getting concepts about FAIR and what is called the personal health train in the Netherlands um, actually implemented so that I, the next time we are, we can easily, more easily um, share data and, and, and link data. Um, but of course, much to learn from not only within your own country, you are rightfully pointing out that um, lockdown measures have been quite different. The strategies of trying to um, combat basically the pandemic have been different. And, and that's really where the lessons can come from, right? By contrasting basically approaches from Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Italy, um, from China and, and, and the US to, to really learn uh, what, what can be effective. Uh, and I think we're, we're very much um, not close to the fact that we actually can do that. And, and, and I think that's something that we as a community um, always realized, but it has now become painfully clear that, it, it, that we have these obstacles. And I think we have to take it upon us to basically see if, how we actually can foster basically this data sharing um, more quickly. The, the other thing that I want to note is that um, what also happened is that there were so many publications coming out um, during the early phase of the pandemic and, and still. Um, and it was incredibly difficult to uh, do your work and, and, and read all the papers and be aware of what is happening everywhere. And so there was quite a bit of duplication of research efforts or um, non-optimal use of data with which we could have better combined to come to clear answers. And I think that's the other thing that um, we, we are working on is basically um, to um, do fair data mining. So actually using AI technology to actually be able to synthesize information that comes out um, during these kind of periods where there's a lot of data coming out to actually try to put it all together so that we actually make quicker progress um, and, and not are, are not are re reinventing the wheel. So I think that's another um, aspect uh, that we, we have learned and that we probably have to invest in to, to make that possible. Well, Roel, thank you for that. And, and, and leading on from that, what, what I often find is that one of the hardest bridges to overcome is, is, is from highly technical biomarker type data and then social health disparities data. Our training is often conducted under different programs. Uh, cross collaborations are still not the norm, at least in my collab. Have you ever, have you seen patterns of this? I know this is not your primary area of work, but have you seen patterns and disparities based on, on, on social factors that, that, that are becoming evident in, in, in your exposomics data sets? Um, I think uh, one of the things, and, and this is not, not exactly my area, but one of the things that we, we noticed, for instance, in the UK Biobank study, when we started to look at who gets tested versus non-tested, um, uh, and, and also look at the positive and negative tests versus the non-tested, you, you actually observe um, quite some interesting patterns about um, who seem to have um, quicker access to to, to testing than, than others. And, and I think if you look clearly at that paper, you can find, um, although we didn't articulate it that, that explicitly, you can clearly find um, disparities um, towards um, access to healthcare, for instance, and access to, to testing. Um, and, and I think that was an, an eye opener for me as well that, that, um, that actually, um, that, that, that it, it, it's clear in, in, the, in the data. Maybe that is naive and I should have known that before, um, but, but it is clear from the data that, that these processes are, are in place. And, and of course, that's an important issue that we, we need to address and that also um, should feature back into the exposome research that we do in general, where we actually have to bring in these social uh, disparities and, and, and inequalities um, back in. Uh, we have to make sure that our research does not lead to an improved health and in increasing um, lives in good health uh, for the people that are in the higher SES and that actually the inequalities increase instead of decrease. And I think that's one of the things that I, um, this pandemic has made clear uh, for some. This was already very clear and I think this only stimulates to, to further look and basically 
making sure that um, health inequalities are actually reduced when we come up with new interventions with new prevention programs and it does not only benefit uh, the people that already benefit the most. And, and you know, it, it's a pattern that, that seems to repeat itself under various different times types of, of, of healthcare system, even highly socialized and apparently, you know, uh, highly equitable healthcare systems where everyone's supposed to be equal, but then there are those who are first amongst equals and those that are last amongst equals. And I, I see what you mean. It, it, it's a pattern that, that just seems to repeat itself. Th thank you for thank you for your for your for your comments. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll stay with your colleague in, in the Netherlands, uh, Dr. Medema. You have, you have approached this in a very unique and very interesting way, the COVID-19 pandemic by examining uh, wastewater. And suddenly, you know, when the pandemic broke out, wastewater epidemiology started making headlines. It was such an interesting way to, to look at, uh, um, at, at this, you know, sort of uh, population or group level trends. Um, can I ask you the similar questions to what I asked of Dr. Vermeulen? Um, did, did you, how did you bring in all the different data sets? Obviously you're collecting wastewater and analyzing that, but then to make sense of it, you have to link it to so many other things. And then as a follow on, I would also like to hear your uh, opinion on whether you saw some, uh, some health disparities in your data. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Yes, um, looking in wastewater for information about um, what happens in a population um, that, that, that uh, requires, of course, some sort of at least a, a validation that uh, what you see, I continue to call it underground, is uh, reflecting what, what is happening above ground. Uh, so that the, the wastewater signal that you pick up is an is an um, reliable, accurate re reflection of what is happening uh, above ground. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's why we started to to see if there was a, a correlation in trends. And uh, many people are trying to really um, translate uh, the data from wastewater uh, concentrations to um, incidents. Uh, and I think. It may be possible, but as I indicated in my talk, uh, you need to combine uh, different sets of information. <clears throat> the amount of dilution of the, the, the signal in wastewater, as I said, if it rains, your, um, your concentration becomes uh, more diluted. And then you think, oh, uh, the trend is going down, but actually it was uh, the rain that diluted the signal. So, uh, but we understand and we have the data on, um, on weather and wastewater flow, so we, we can normalize for that but then um, we have a normalized wastewater signal and we have to uh, relate that to um, shedding rates of viruses so there's a lot of types of information that you need to um, combine there uh, to uh, make that um, make that work but um, as long as th this th I think it will continue to be challenging to uh, make accurate predictions of, of uh, incidents of prevalence based on on wastewater data because of the variability in shedding rates, uh, but at least uh, we see that uh, the trends uh, or resurfacing is something that we can pick up. And I think, um, well, I was, uh, I, um, you talked about Flint, um, and, and so if if we expanded it, the, um, the um, our focus uh, on wastewater surveillance from uh, COVID-19 to a, a, a bit broader or much broader. Uh, I think that wastewater um, is also uh, something that uh, can really be used to um, look at um, what is happening in, in society. And in Flint, um, uh, you may be aware of that, that uh, Virginia Tech had used um, sewage sludge of uh, archived sewage sludge samples of uh, the Flint uh, wastewater treatment plant to, to look at the population exposure uh, to lead during the, uh, the the water switch there. So, uh, and I think it's um, a clear example of uh, maybe maybe not individual uh, um, exposure like you're doing with uh, the truth uh, the the teeth study, but um, it is uh, an indication of population exposure. And uh, what we've learned also with the COVID-19 is that um, 
when we zoom in uh, into a city, we can look in different city areas um, at the circulation of the virus. That's also something that you could do, for instance, for the lead. Um, but we also have been doing um, illicit drug use um, through wastewater studies uh, together with uh, European partners uh, where we can look at um, the use of uh, illicit drugs in, in cities and, and wastewater is then again an objective way to um, to collect that type of information, which is very difficult to um, to collect uh, in in any other means um, because well, people are not um, um, inclined to to give um, the uh, reliable information about that. So I think also in the the current opioid crisis, it it, it can help to give uh, this information, um, objective information about what happens in the in, in our cities. And then, as I said, if you, we can uh, also zoom in, in in cities. And what we've learned in with the COVID-19 surveillance is that um, there is disparities between uh, different city areas and they seem to be aligned with um, also disparities in socioeconomic status. Uh, but that is something we are still uh, exploring. But uh, at, at least that um, the, the sewer signal was now used for the municipal health service to say, okay, the, in this area, <clears throat> the sewer signal is higher than um, we would expect from the, the, um, the reported cases we see in that area. So we'll move in that uh, city area with uh, test buses. Uh, we'll um, call on everybody in that area to uh, get tested and make it uh, relatively easy for them to um, to have access to these uh, testing uh, facilities. So there you can, uh, well, we, we observed, or maybe it was more uh, confirmed, uh, there's disparities in different city areas. And um, well, as I said, now the, there's action taken based on that uh, to try and resolve that. Thank you for that. Um, and, and forgive my ignorance about you know general structure of society in the Netherlands. I haven't I've only visited uh, once briefly, but uh, as I'm looking at what's happening in different countries and in poorer countries, and even within U.S. society, uh, there are economic impacts of the COVID pandemic. Now this is resulting in homelessness, and we're seeing it even in New York City, right? So it's not just uh, you know not, not just homelessness of men, which is the predominant group. But now families are becoming homeless. Same, similar uh, reports are coming in from from India, where, where you know where I'm originally from. How is this, you know, certain movement in society? Obviously, when you live in proper housing, there is a certain uh, way you can map back the sewage source to the number of people. You know, New York City is very high density, so often hundreds of people living in a small building. But you can still tap into that. As this is causing such social disruption, people are moving towards you know, mobilizing homelessness, these other issues. Is there any data that you are seeing that, that shows how the, 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 the pandemic is moving in the, your sewage data and can, then can be mapped to these, these very social issues? Um, the, well, if, if I look at the, the situation, um, uh, particularly in, a, in the Netherlands, I, uh, what I observe is that um, the disparities that I uh, was referring to is um, not so much associated to, to things like um, losing uh, your, um, your home, but uh, it's more associated to um, certain um, or the socioeconomic areas with people with uh, jobs um, in distribution centers and uh, so uh, maybe the, the, the lower paid jobs where uh, people have to um, have to continue to work um, to create um, um, to get paid to uh, to to uh, so it is more um, that uh, and these people will also be more reluctant to show up at, at testing streets because if they're positive, they uh, they can they have to report that uh, and and they will lose uh, or they have the risk to of losing their uh, their job. So I see that type of um, um, of situation and uh, maybe um, but we need to do uh, a deeper dive into um, what causes these disparities together with the municipal health service to really understand what is uh, what is happening. 
on on another um, thing that you touched uh, with with a, is that um, if you are connected to a sewer and <clears throat> you're localized, then you contribute to uh, this uh, sewer surveillance. Um, we're also working with um, African um, cities uh, and partners to see if uh, you could use this type of surveillance also in non sewer settings. Uh, because, of course, then, uh, if, you, if you don't have a sewer, uh, this the system, sewer surveillance uh, will not work. But in, uh, for instance, in South Africa, in the informal uh, settings, um, the, the partners there are using uh, drains and uh, rivers that uh, flow through these settings and where people uh, use that uh, for their uh, waste disposal, also fecal waste disposal, uh, to, uh, as a, a similar indicator of uh, the circulation of the virus in the, those communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, um, for, for, for all, all of that input. Um, I'll move on to another topic for which we, we have several questions, and that, that, that's got to do with, with vaccines. So um, I'll start off uh, with, and we have a resident vaccine expert now, um, um, Dr. Tompkins. Um, uh, very general question before I dig into follow-up follow uh, questions on, on, on how, it's, how it's going to help in the future. So given that there is so much interest in the vaccine, uh, the general question is, what are the lessons for the future that you have learned? And I know so many members of the audience and just people that we run into want to know what more is needed given the variants in the virus, given all, all, all of the changes that are happening with this pandemic. What is your sense of the outlook for, for the coming months and, and the years? Uh, it's a, a loaded question in a lot of ways, but I'll uh, do my best. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think some of the lessons that we've learned in terms of, you know, certainly rapid vaccine development in that, you know, from the U.S. perspective, this is the most rapid, and it's still not, you know, officially licensed, but emergency use approval of two vaccines in less than a year is remarkable. Um, Having said that, the, you know, those vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines were, you know, built upon other studies for other pathogens using the same technology. So it wasn't truly starting from scratch, but building on other, you know, vaccine development studies. And so I think that really reinforces one basic idea that, you know, even if vaccines aren't eventually going to market, those studies are incredibly valuable because we had, uh, safety profiles for using RNA vaccines. Similarly for the AstraZeneca, you know, the ad, uh, vac the ad vaccines, we've got safety data for those that supports these, you know, innovative platforms for rapid development of vaccines. Um, so while it was incredibly quick, I think that it can be done without shortcuts. And I was early on concerned about the, the US approach that there would be corners cut uh, but not because of science. And I was very happy to see that uh, that the appropriate uh, you know tests were done and safe and precautions were done. And I'm very confident uh, in the vaccines that are now authorized for use. And I think they're very safe and it's remarkable. The efficacy of these vaccines is incredible. Uh, so I think that this really speaks to, you know, the next generation of vaccines. We shouldn't replace all, all of our vaccines with these current platforms but it does speak to new technology certainly can uh, be used in the future as well as potentially fill gaps, particularly with pandemics. And that's certainly of huge value. Um, I think another thing that we learned is that and going back to some early uh, discussions, you know, the sharing of data, the sharing of resources, the sharing of knowledge needs to be very effective. And, you know, the first sharing of sequences, that's what enabled this rapid uh, start of vaccine production with the molecular platforms. As soon as the sequences release, were released, researchers and companies could begin developing their vaccines. And so in some cases, the pilot vaccine lots were prepared before the pandemic had, you know, tr truly taken hold and we knew the magnitude of that pandemic. Um, so I think that really does reinforce that need for openness, not just in terms of sharing of data, but uh, you know the you know the the global sharing of information about outbreaks and uh, epidemics. Uh, you know, speaking 
to the uh, variants and other you know, aspects of the, the changing uh, landscape of the pandemic, uh, all of the data I have seen to date suggests that the, for the vaccines licensed in the US, the Moderna and Pfizer, they are still going to be effective against all of the variants, including the South African variant, although there are data showing that there's a reduction in neutralizing antibody titers against that variant, but it still appears to be you know, at a threshold well above what would be required for protective immunity. Uh, admittedly, these are some assumptions. You know, the, the virus is a year old at this point. The uh, vaccine's less than a year old, so we still have a lot of assumptions and we'll continue to learn. But I think right now the vaccines that are being implemented in the US will continue to be effective. I don't know about details for the AstraZeneca vaccine. I'm really excited about that one as well, just because of the opportunity to effectively vaccinate global populations. Now, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, as I've said, are fantastic, but the ch cold cha chain requirements at this point are really just debilitating for uh, global distribution. We're having issues in the US distributing these vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other platforms, uh, the, uh, the CanSinovac, where they're seeing 50% efficacy, that's still, that's not bad. And I, I don't think that we should ignore that as a vaccine, but when there are other vaccines that have much greater efficacy, if the resources could be put into those, as making sure that we still have the implementation for distribution to developing countries, you know, using the Gavi platforms and others, I think that's that would be very valuable. But we do need to explore more of the potential for the variants. Now, the fact that we already see the manufacturers addressing variants is very impressive, I think. We may not need it, but considering a, a third vaccination or a variant booster, if you will, that's a great opportunity with these molecular platforms where they can readily modify the, the vaccine. And while it still have to go through the approval process, it could you know, theoretically be implemented uh, uh, still within the 2021 to address any potential um, variants. But I think the last and most important thing along those lines is we do need to, you know, robustly vaccinate and make sure that we, you know, have the required boosters, which from a public health perspective is a nightmare. Getting, you know, everyone vaccinated once is a nightmare. Getting everyone vaccinated twice isn't twice as hard, it's 10 times as hard. And uh, so we really do need to follow through with that because if we end up with a large partially immune population, we may end up driving an increase in these variants. So there's still a lot of public health challenges there. And, and th th that's an excellent point. Uh, and, and just to, you know, promote the message, I, I received my first dose, which was Moderna, and I had no side effects. It, you know, so I encourage everyone to spread the word. But then on your last point, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful uh, that uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is supposed to be a single dose, will, you know, also be, you know, as effective and, and, and help us with some of the logistical problems. Yeah, yeah, I agree. The the J and J vaccine is looks promising. I haven't seen the most recent data for that, and so there's even been discussion maybe they will want to boost. But I agree uh, because my lab works with the virus. We were put into the queue to get vaccinated early, so I just received my booster last week, and I agree. The fantastic, no issues for me. I know that there are some um, moderate adverse events, but absolutely worthwhile and. Uh, I, I, I have one more question for you, which is, I, I know slightly, it might be slightly outside your field of experts. So I'm going to ask Dr. Ro Rosalind Wright to be ready to, to jump in and, and help answer this. What about vaccine hesitancy? Because that has become uh, a, a barrier, but apart from the technological barrier, apart from the logistical barriers of keeping it you know, really cold and transporting it adequately, there is, and historically, there are reasons why minority populations, populations of color, very hesitant to trust these vaccines. Uh, what have you seen from your data? What is your opinion on that? Uh, so that's definitely a problem here in the United States uh, for this vaccine. And it, it always has been a problem. We could, we could talk for weeks about vaccine hesitancy. And uh, yeah. we have a program here at UGA that uh, looks at communications about risk and vaccine hesitancy and studying that. And it's it's an important question that we really do need to invest the resources in. And this goes to the larger question of effective science communication. Um, you know, I think 
for us to reduce vaccine hesitancy, we need to, you know, the most aggressive things we can do are, are improve messaging and communicate effectively. But I think we need to do have a much larger approach to this in terms of, you know, trying to reduce the the disparities in, uh, you know, just availability of public uh, public health because that's where some of that hesitancy comes from. There's historical uh, disparities as well that we need to overcome with, you know, stronger social programs to, you know, reduce that, uh, you know, just the mistrust. And it's not just in uh, underrepresented populations. Uh, there is just poor messaging in general. And there's so many reasons for that. Uh, and most of it's outside of my wheelhouse. But uh, I think we do need to help with just that basic communication and, you know, scientists want to speak truth. And so when you have a, an adverse event associated with it, even though there's no associ association other than that temporal association, it's still reported as an adverse event. And that the understanding of why that is, there's a gap there. And, it, uh, and so it's hard to you know, speak truth and at the same time, not engender that distrust. And uh, that I think we need to strengthen funding in communication programs for our doctoral trainees to communicate their science, but also expand that science of communication and really make it a, a public health priority. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Roz, is there something you would like to add to that? Yeah, this is a very important area. The, the messaging is, is very important and, and consistent messaging. Um, and, and part of the problem is we have a number of vaccines, right? Um, that you were just talking about. And it's not just one and people get confused and, and you know, how do I decide? And some people get very, um, you know, bogged down in that. But um, I, I, and the other thing is, is here in the United States, the states were kind of left up to doing this each state. And everybody's doing it a little bit differently and everybody sort of looked at the regulations a little bit differently and, and followed those strictly or not. I'll tell you, um, the messaging and people modeling, getting it from the, the president, the vice president, celebrities, these kinds of things, that goes to the messaging somewhat and reassures people. But when you go to the community and it comes from the community and from the folks like them, that's where I think we've seen some of the biggest inroad to getting people a little more comfortable with it. West Virginia had success because they decided um, maybe I'm not going to go the big um, chains like CVS and Walgreens. Maybe I'm not going to go to the big drugstore chains, but let's do the mom and pop um, chains. And that's more of a rural state in a lot of uh, ways. So that worked very well for them. So we really have to kind of meet people where they are when we're trying to, to engage people. Uh, it's remarkable to me that even frontline healthcare workers, it's about two thirds uptake. It's, you would think those would be, they'd be lining up because they know they got to keep getting back in there and, and doing their job. They want to do their job. They see that as their mission. But there is even have a hesitancy there um, that, that somewhat subsides as more of us get vaccinated and we don't have uh, significant consequences from it. Um, but it, it definitely is public health messaging, consistent messaging. And this was a problem that was here before COVID on so many levels, right? As we talked about, we're, we had a thin layer of veneer on some of these things, and this just magnified it. The, we have to deal with these long-term as well, not just the short-term, because this probably isn't the last pandemic. Um, you know, that, it's not gonna be another 100 years before we face this again. I think one thing that Dr. Tom can say that I find is very helpful is to continue to note that, yeah, in record speed, we, we saw these vaccines come, um, much to many of our own, you know, uh, somewhat surprise. But to note that 20 years of research, was that was built on 20 years of research. That didn't just happen overnight. And to your point, it had been tried with other um, pathogens, et cetera. So it was just um, something that we could leverage and take advantage of. And then the other thing I think um, uh, this whole pandemic has done, we talked about need for open science, um, team science, sharing data, information, knowledge. That was never as exemplified as 
in COVID. And we saw just barriers broke down to our data science folks talking to our healthcare workers. Hey, I need to understand this. How can we get together? They were um, doing AI using our electronic health record data on Mount, you know, Mount Sinai is a health system with eight different hospitals. Um, you know, we've been trying and struggling and trying to get people to do that for years in a significant way. And when they needed it, and I, we're trying to say, okay, we broke through that barrier. Let's, how do we build on that? How do we do, you know, what Rel was talking about, right? That is a gap, linking it to the electronic health record data, that sort of thing. So there's some silver linings too, some challenge silver linings, but um, we definitely need to keep working on this vaccine uptake because if we do it spottily, we'll give those variants an opportunity. What, what you said really resonated with me about messaging. Uh, what I find is that things that are very, very important are, are ones where we've had almost no training, you know, in, in our clinical training or our scientific research training messaging and speaking and communicating to the public was an afterthought, if that. Um, I don't remember attending a single lecture in my undergraduate or graduate training on, on how to communicate the truth in a highly politicized environment. What I find is that often the path of scientists leaving the politicians to communicate the scientific message has failed us repeatedly. And that is nothing new, whether it's vaccines and autism, vaccines, uh, safety, and, and for COVID-19. And I think for me personally, it, it's a lesson that we need to change the way we train physicians and train health scientists to put out a clear message with our publications so that every day mom and pop can read that message and say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've increased my knowledge. And this is, shouldn't be just a, a Wikipedia project. I think it should come with every journal article, a message that, you know, your average friend who's not from a science background can understand. Anyway, thank, thank, thank you for the comments. I, I have some more questions. Um, Dr. Borghese and, and Dr. Bon, Bontepi, uh, thank you uh, for, for your very nice talks. I know you come from a, uh, you know, from a background of, of technological development and you gave some, some very nice uh, joint presentation on, on new sampling approaches. Uh, to, to measure uh, the, the transmission via, via, via air. So let me start off with a general question before we dig into some of the follow-on ones. Well, what, what have you learned from this pandemic? Obviously your technology would have been developed and refined very quickly to be applied here, but as we are seeing that this pandemic is, is stretching out and it might will definitely won't be the last pandemic we face. What are the lessons you have learned uh, for, for future public health crises? Yes, I will respond with the um, general um, uh, response. Um, the main message I understood um, related to COVID-19 is that um, all the research discipline must uh, collaborate um, in an uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach. Uh, I work, uh, I am um, environmental chemist, I work with um, uh, sociologists, with our economists, and we make um, um, a paper about uh, the possible uh, social um, tra um, transmittance of COVID-19. Then uh, it's very important to um, approach the pandemic problem from all uh, points of view. Um, because uh, um, all the um, health, social, economic factors are all connected with the um, pandemic. And the studies uh, must also promote uh, the people resilience. So then, uh, for example, study some um, uh, non-pharmaceutical measure to um, increase the, the res resilience of population. And um, I also uh, um, agree that it's very important that uh, researcher um, disseminates uh, the scientific method and the approaches used in science, because it's very important to increase the public acceptance of scientific results. For example, in some countries, um, some restriction measures are still poorly accepted. For example, face mask wearing is accepted almost by all the population in China. 
And in Europe, in Europe there are uh, different uh, acceptance. For example, northern um, country um, accept, um, accept uh, very well uh, this, uh, this um, restriction. In Italy, uh, face, mask, uh, face mask wearing um, in general is um, um, accepted. And uh, another uh, fundamental um, um, message concerned the um, vaccine, vaccination because uh, a recent publication in Nature Journal report that um, the lower social acceptance of vaccine will make it very hard to reach the global immunity in a few years. And this is an aspect very important for, uh, for uh, scientists. Thank you for that. When I was listening to your talk about transmission and everything, it, it, it suddenly made me think, and it's not my area at all, so this is a comment on which you, you, you can or cannot expand, that it, it suddenly caused large numbers of, of, of sections of our population to move indoors and spend a lot more time indoors and a lot less time outdoors. But that's going to have huge health implications just from you know, exposure to sunlight and things like that, the, the, the travel. Some will be good. I think we, we might be reducing some emissions that were related to, to traveling to work. At the same time, uh, what I find is there's not any clear information that if you test positive, how does the virus transmit indoors in your living environment? Especially in, in you know, I'm biased because I live in, in New York. And if you look at New York City, often families live in a one bedroom or two bedroom. You know, how does transmission happen in, in, in a residential setting, how can people you know, take charge of that themselves if one person has tested positive? Uh, and I'm entirely speaking this from personal experience that a close colleague of mine got infected, went home, and then everybody in the family got infected because they live in such close quarters. I, I don't know if your research touches on this, but if, if you have any opinion, that, that, that would be great. Um, I um, only have um, a clarification before uh, that my colleague yeah. will respond yeah. better to this question. Sure. Concerning airborne um, uh, virus transmission, yes. um, there are uh, several um, articles, but uh, um, this uh, definition of airborne transmission of virus yeah. was um, poorly clarified in the, the first uh, papers. Then uh, this message about the transmission in door to door was passed in um, different ways. It is was not uh, um, help, not helping the, um, uh, the knowledge about uh, the correct mechanism of transmission. Well, I think that uh, um, there is uh, a lot of uh, resistance against uh, the measurement of. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the possible presence of the virus in the air. And uh, uh, in um, uh, my, our, um, our vision is that uh, it should be um, politically encouraged that uh, uh, the transmission uh, through uh, public uh, uh, transportation as well as indoor houses uh, should be tested as uh, um, this data should be, it could be useful for uh, you and as uh, environmental and physician uh, uh, that uh, you know you can know uh, the exposure the real exposure and not only the uh, some numerical simulation about what can happen and if uh, um, uh, it is known that uh, in a house uh, where uh, one person is infected and maybe this person has uh, no other place to go and should live with his family in that room, maybe some uh, measure of uh, um, uh, prevention like uh, frequent ventilation may save the people in the house. Uh, and uh, I can speak, I have infected my whole family in March <laughs> last year, and uh, no one of us was aware about uh, the um, no one would even say that uh, we get uh, that I got COVID because I was the first. And I think I got it from uh, um, traveling from Milan to Brescia in one very small uh, train, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, environment with the other 50 people coming with me from Milan to Brescia. All of us were speaking loudly, probably at the telephone, and breathing the same air and without any ventilation. And obviously, in late February, no one wear masks. So 
prevention measurement, in my opinion, are fundamental, so social distance and also mask wearing. But if we know what we are really breathing, we can get uh, uh, some uh, uh, more data about uh, the real um, uh, uh, transmission uh, probability. And we get some uh, calculation about that and uh, the incidence then uh, uh, on the susceptibility that, uh, of course, uh, our data as a chemist and technologist can provide to the assessment of uh, uh, epidemiologists and also expose on uh, expert people like you. Thank you very much. And I would encourage you, if you ever visit New York City, please, please uh, take a ride in our, one of our subways. I think it will make you appreciate your, your train from Milan to Brescia and <laughs> much more. Uh, uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank all, all, all the, the panelists and, and the speakers of today. Thank you very much for your contribution. It, it, it was truly wonderful. Uh, I'll hand back to our host, Dr. Megan Horton. Uh, Megan, over to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Aurora, and to all of our panelists. Wow, what an amazing two days. We have heard from researchers presenting innovative and thoughtful work introducing new methods and innovative tools to improve and analyze exposure data to advance our scientific understanding of how our internal and external environments, our physical, chemical, and social environment, beginning before we we're born, contribute to our health trajectory throughout life. We have explored the role of exposomics in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and health disparities research. In the panel discussion today, stimulated by concerns and issues of COVID-19, vaccination, prevention, distribution, um, and uh, vaccination hesitancy, we discussed the importance of scientific messaging and communication. This point in particular mirrored Dr. Balshaw's discussion yesterday, where he expressed the critical importance of communication. It's critical that we communicate with our leaders, with policymakers, with our communities, and with each other to advance this critical science. We thank all of you for attending and for your attention. We encourage you to keep up the connections and the science and hope to see everyone next year. A few final housekeeping notes. We'll distribute a brief evaluation form via email and welcome your feedback on the program. Videos of the speakers will be available soon after we check with speakers that we can in fact share their presentations. As we conclude the, the formal program, we invite you to a final opportunity to discuss in the spatial chat breakout rooms. As a quick reminder, uh, in the New York City room, Coffee, Bagels, and Locks will be Dr. Rosalind Wright, joined by Mark Tompkins and Donatella Placidi. In the Utrecht room, Stoop Fafels, Roel, and Herjan will be there. Uh, in the Brescia room, the uh, Frank Corda Bubbles, Laura and Elza, and Manish will be at the beach. We hope to see everyone in the spatial chat. This is the conclusion of the formal program and we hope to see everyone soon. Thank you again for attending.